Um, really pleased to introduce uh, Ed Stein. Um, we have uh, a different kind of deep history that goes back. Uh, first I first met Ed in uh, 1988, and you know, uh, he was my first uh, and most endearing uh, roommate when we were on the job market together in uh, 1992. He has a PhD in philosophy from the Linguistics of Philosophy at MIT, uh, but then advanced significantly and went back to law school. Uh, another five years later, and is now uh, at Yale, and is now a uh, professor at the Cardozo Law School. His talk uh, reflects the, the core of his work on um, categories of sexual orientation, law science, and society. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thank you all. Um, my talk's going to be a little bit different. First of all, my, my slides are even more low-tech, but that was because I put them together last night when I found that everyone else was using PowerPoint. Um, uh, and so it was sort of a little bit of technology envy. I thought I would do something. And second of all, I'm not really talking. I'm talking about um, kinds within humans, um, um, as whether people are talking about sort of the limits of, of human kinds. I'm talking more about um, uh, whether they're di uh, the, uh, about different kinds of humans and about a particular um, uh, implication um, uh, of that. And I'm, I'm really going to be talking about four different issues, some of them just a little bit. Um, first of all, I'm interested in uh, the question, are sexual orientations human kinds? And I'm going to be talking about this as a particular implication to, um, as an example, sexual orientation in U.S. Uh, equal protection jurisprudence. So a sort of practical legal implication of this question, are sexual orientations human kinds? And this question connects up with two other uh, sets of questions. Um, scientific research on what makes a person gay, straight, et cetera. Um, and ethical implications of scientific research on sexual orientation. I'll probably talk about that. The the least. I want to begin with a digression. Uh, on August 9, 2007, there is a cable TV uh, town hall for the Democratic presidential candidates. It was a very odd thing. And one of the questioners was Melissa Etheridge, a pop singer, and she asked Governor Bill Richardson at the time, uh, who was a candidate for uh, Democratic presidential nomination, the following question. Do you think homosexuality is a choice or is it biological? Um, and uh, Richardson's answer was, it's a choice. Um, now, skip ahead. He said some other things, which I'll talk about in a minute. But his first answer was, it's a choice. And there was some sort of booing and uh, muttering in the audience. And Melissa Etheridge said, maybe you don't understand my question. I'll ask it again. Um, uh, and then he, he'll say something else. But then afterwards, he had a press conference. And he gave all these reasons said why he actually didn't mean to say what he said. He said, well. <laughs> I, I f took a red eye in order to get here. I had flown all night. Uh, that was his first answer. He said, I thought this was a tricky science question. Um, and, and then he said, well, actually, I love choice. I love choice because I'm a fan um, of women's right to choose. I'm so committed to choice. I answer it's a choice to almost any question I can. Um, I mean, he didn't put it quite that way, but that's in effect what he meant. So I thought choice must be the right answer because that's the politically correct thing to say. And so poor Governor Richardson, who seems like a perfectly nice fellow, um, got, you know, was tied all into knots about this. And, and maybe it was the beginning of the end of his uh, candidacy for president. I don't know. But actually, um, I think that what he said after he said it's a choice, although it was a bit confused, was actually the right answer to the question. Um, what he said is, I don't see this question Melissa Ather has asked, is, is homosexuality a choice or a matter of biology? I don't see this as an issue of science or definition. I see gays and lesbians as people, as a matter of human decency. I see it as a matter of love and companionship and people loving each other. You know, I don't like the categories people. I don't like to like answer definitions like that. This is the part that he's sort of rambling on. Uh, but, you know, it's a press conference and you didn't have any sleep. You know, perhaps they're grounded in science or something else that I don't understand. And actually, I think this is the right answer to the question. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that as we go through. I actually don't think we understand the science of how sexual orientation developed. I don't think we understand the issues about choice and so forth. I, I think if someone says that they um, have a, they understand this, they're wrong. Um, and I think that he's right that we shouldn't think about issues of uh, human rights, in particular, in this case, gay rights, as issues about science or categories or definitions in the way that um, uh, was sort of, under, was sort of um, undergirding the uh, question from Melissa Etheridge. OK, so now uh, a little bit about you. So now um, taking these questions, put it in one particular specific context of, uh, 
uh, equal protection uh, jurisprudence in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, here is a little quote from the United States Constitution. Um, it says, uh, no state shall deny to any persons within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, what does this mean? Um, sounds, sounds nice. Um, well, the Supreme Court has taken this clause to mean that um, laws that make use of certain kinds of classifications, what, we'll call, what they call suspect classifications, um, for example, race or sex classifications, um, must be viewed with great skepticism and closely scrutinized. Um, the technical term is they should be given heightened scrutiny. So whenever a law makes use of a category that's, uh, um, that's suspect, uh, the Supreme Court is going to give a really hard look at it. Uh, gee, here's a law, it makes use of sex classification. Sometimes that might be okay, but because of, the his because of a variety of reasons, we're generally very suspicious. We don't, we're worried about laws that make you distinguish between men and women. Um, so uh, the real question is, how do we know which classifications, which kind of classifications? We know that sex and race are on the list. There's some others that might be on the list, uh, illegitimacy, citizenship depending on how you think about it, religious affiliation, um, what um, classifications warrant heightened scrutiny? And what uh, a whole team of uh, law professors have gotten tenure on is trying to sort of say what are, as philosophers might put it, necessary and sufficient conditions for um, getting heightened scrutiny, for a classification warranting heightened scrutiny. And the Supreme Court has said a variety of things about it. Um, first of all, I say, has a classification been historically used to intentionally discriminate against a particular group? Um, so we look at the history. Um, the second thing is whether the use of this classification is related to the ability to contribute to society. Um, thirdly, whether any group demarcated by this classification lacks political power to combat discrimination against it. Um, and finally, the one that I'll be focusing on today and if, is whether any group demarcated by this classification e exhibits obvious, immutable, or distinguishing characteristics that define it as discrete and insular. And in particular, what um, some constitutional theorists and some courts have focused on is immutability. And the idea is that if we could show that a characteristic is immutable or innate or inborn, um, then we um, uh, can show it deserves heightened scrutiny. That's sort of the idea, and we could see this um, working in the contrapositive form, I believe it is, I guess that's right, in the, in the, in the Washington Supreme Court's uh, 2006 opinion about gay marriage. And so in that case, there were some uh, plaintiffs who were same-sex couples in Washington, and they sued the state of Washington, saying we need, should be allowed to, to get married. And one way that they, one part of their argument was sexual orientation classifications warrant heightened scrutiny. Um, so you should really be suspicious of a law which says that uh, gay people can't get married and straight people can get married to people they love. And the Washington Supreme Court rejected the, the, this attempt to get heightened scrutiny for sexual orientation classifications. They said, to qualify as a suspect class for purposes of equal protection analysis, the characteristic, the, the characteristic defining the class must be an obvious immutable trait. So in other words, it's a requirement for heightened scrutiny, says the Washington Supreme Court, that um, um, a classification, uh, a characteristic defining the class must be immutable. Um, and they say in this case, plans do not cite any authority in support of the conclusion that homosexuality is an immutable characteristic. They must make a showing of immutability, and they have not, therefore, in effect, with a bunch of other words following that, they lose uh, um, sexual orientation, not, not, not subject to uh, strict scrutiny, not heightened, uh, uh, um, heightened scrutiny. Therefore, um, the argument for same-sex marriage in Washington fails.